then they went in uh, and was very prominent in how he studied uh, the uh, diseases that would cause infertility among mares, and he had it stud in the jack and he stood them. And uh, the one time he went in and learned artificial inseminating and he bred 18 mares one morning at our place. And I was a kid about so high and I got curious. Well, then the combines, the early combines started out August Luderman up there, had what they called the old Canadian stripper. And then later years, another fellow came in and uh, Kurt Bowen. Well, now that is the uh, the gleaner, gleaner that Alice Chalmers has yeah. now. Kurt Boulder and uh, Tom Sissels is where he had it. Well, they had the the header barge. I don't know if you know what a header barge is or not, but where they just went around and clipped the head. They took uh, uh, four head of horses and pushed the header, and they fill a header barge full of hay and then stack it. And then that winter, after it had gone through a sweat, they'd thrash it. Do you have any old farm equipment around? I've got some, yes. Yeah, we've got, we're trying to collect some. We've got, uh, uh, we've got a grill up here I can't identify yet. Mm -hmm. We'd like to uh, ease the video and have, uh, you know, someone as yourself explain each piece of farm equipment, how it was used, of the old horse-drawn equipment. Well, I've got the, I've got a, a Model D up there, steel, and then I've got the, one of John Deere's first yeah, plows. I the clock. What? Yeah, I stopped the clock. Yeah. That's... <laughs> I was just thinking of that. Yep. Nothing hurts that. And, uh, uh, yeah, we've got uh, in the farm equipment, and then uh, the later on they become the, the they got the binder to come in. And uh, I was old enough that uh, when they brought the binder in for binding corn, they cut it by sledge or by hand, and the uh, McCormick. People uh, brought down a fellow in the, at Ed Living Goods, and uh, he uh, said that at noon table, uh, one fellow made the remark, says it's marvelous how they cut that corn, and they get it just about so big, and, it, and they lay it down, and he says they they've got a machine now that'll cut off a piece of string just long enough to go around it. And it ties a knot in one end. Says so someday some fool's going to get it where he'll tie those knots together. And that, uh, uh, that fellow was doing the experiment. He didn't appreciate that very much. But it was about oh, I'd say five, six years after that that we had a good corn binder. Mm -hmm. That was much harder to make tie than wheat binders were. But um, now on on that line there. But what I told Russell Pearson and that group down there at Oklahoma City that uh, I told about how Dad come across, staked his claim, and uh, where he went and his brothers, and when they went to file for it, his brother didn't get his claim because they let a woman in the head of him who had gone to school with my mother, and she filed on it. So Uncle Joe didn't get his claim. Uh, they let women ahead of them. And then uh, uh, the next year, is the uh, first year was a complete failure in wheat. And the next year, he borrowed, uh, mortgaged his horses to get the grain. And uh, everybody said he's crazy, but he said that if he, did, if he had to... Uh, raise corn for eight and ten cents a bushel and haul it to Bluff City, Kansas, he's going to find another job because they had to raise wheat. And the second year, he got a 50 bushel wheat crop. Now, I, I can follow through on stuff like that. Is a, if you want to... Sure. Um, you know,
know Wayne Lyles and Russell Pearson? Oh, yeah. I know Wayne Lyles. Yeah. I do. Well, Wayne was one that and Russell had me come down. I've vested with them for, oh, too long, but they all stayed. Yeah. I interviewed Wayne about the Bataan Death March. Well, he was on the Death March in the Philippines in World yeah. War II. We got him on tape about that. Yeah. Well, you about ready? Well, I, I think so, whichever okay. way you want to, whichever way you want to start. Okay, this is March 30th, 1989. My name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Mr. Lloyd Long, and we're in your home in Garber, Oklahoma. Sir, what's your address here? Uh, you, you might think that's crazy, but I can't tell you. I'm two blocks east of John Deere, with three cedars on the south side of my house. But I do think it's a, uh, we just don't remember addresses in a small town. We go from place to place. Mm -hmm. You just know who lives in the house. <laughs> That's right. So where were you born? I was born in Manchester, Oklahoma, or uh, north of Waukegan. And when's your birthday? December the 3rd, December 23rd, 1903. 1903. And who was your father? Uh, William Long, W.C. Long. And your mother? It was Catella, K-O-E-T-A-L-L-A, Catella May. They called her May Long, but Catella was her Indian name. She was not Indian. Okay, uh, was May her maiden name? Uh, no, Long. Uh, she was Lonis. L O N E S. L O N E S. Yeah, May Lonis. And where were your parents born? Uh, mother was born in Ohio, and I believe uh, my father was born. I believe it's in Ohio too. Somebody, they did not meet, however, back there. They met in Kansas. Were either one of your grandfathers in the Civil War? Yes. Grandfather Lonis was. In fact, I have the gun that he carried in the Civil War. How do you spell Lonis? L-O-N-E-S. L-O-N-E-S. What was his given name? Commodore. Commodore. Commodore R. Lonis. And from Ohio, I assume he fought for the North. He fought for the North. Any stories about him that you've heard in the Civil War? I remember one time as a curious kid when I was there and I asked him if he ever killed a man. I realize now that that wasn't a good question to ask a person who had been in a war because they don't like to think of it. They think of the enemy. And he said that nearly all day he and another fellow had been firing at each other they had their embankment up and they'd take a load and roll over and fire and then roll back and load. And he says, I got loaded and uh, instead of firing the first time, when he fired at me, I waited until he went down and just as he come up, I was lying and he didn't come back anymore. That's the nearest that he knew whether he'd uh, killed anybody. But uh, it, it was... Uh, a different war than we fight now, nowadays. Do you know which unit he was a member? Uh, we have uh, records of it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, any major battles that he, in which he took part? No, I don't. My brother is a historian, but uh, I do not. I know that he went clear down into Georgia. For Sherman. Yeah. What about on your father's side? My father's side, my grandfather Long uh, did not fight. He was an asthmatic and uh, uh, they said when he was born he was small enough you could put him in a quart cup. But at one time he weighed nearly 400 pounds. And we have uh, pictures and all when he uh, would have to hold his arms up like this on a cane so he could breathe. 
and he studied to be a doctor. And when the opening of Old Oklahoma, he staked the claim east of Dover in Old Oklahoma, and uh, he was known as Dr. Long in that section of the country and was uh, uh, given medicine and supplies to uh, help keep the people from starving and the crisis that they had immediately following the opening of Old Oklahoma. What was his given name? John. John. Dr. John Long. The so records show in Oklahoma City that he never lost a case. I can't believe that myself, but I do know that he was always willing to go, and uh, in his later years, uh, the only way that he could go from one place to another or go to the family that was sick was in a spring wagon, and it had my uncle that drove the team said that he would have to uh, load him kind of like you would a sow, back the spring wagon up to the door, and he'd lay down in the back of the wagon, and he'd have them run the horses to the whoever was sick if there's an emergency, and he'd stay there until the person was well, and then they'd take him back the next day or whenever it was. But when he passed away down there a good many years ago, I was told that uh, the black and white community met at the house and walked from the house to the cemetery, which is on that quarter and uh, said there was over a thousand at the funeral. Was that in Dover? That's uh, east of Dover at Banner Cemetery there. Did uh, he talk about the day of the run, making the run in Old Oklahoma? Yes, uh, I remember the stories that they've told about that when they come in. My, my father was too young at that time, and uh, so Grandpa made the run, and they came in there, and the uh, Next morning, uh, they got up and they went out, and somebody had driven a stake out in front of their camp, where they camp. And the stake happened to be driven in their wagon track. Consequently, when they approached the people who was camped below them, that the stake was there, they showed them where the stake was in their wagon, and they moved on down uh, to the west down on the river bottom. And the uh, oddity of that, uh, as we chase back history, my grandfather Lonis, who was in the Civil War, uh, he staked the claim to the west of Grandpa Long. And he only remained there a short time. And uh, mother and dad become acquainted back up in Anthony, Kansas. And the cemetery, Banner Cemetery, original cemetery, was a, a deed of land from uh, John Long and Commodore Lonis. Each one of them gave a track of land for making the Banner Cemetery. And it happens that that's my grandparents on both sides. The name Banner? Banner Cemetery, yes. Well, where the name is derived from what? The name Banner? I don't know. Uh, the, uh, have you ever traveled the road between Crescent and Dover? Yes, sir. Well, there used to be a schoolhouse about halfway on the north side, and that was the Banner Schoolhouse. And uh, Grandpa Long's place uh, cornered that to the southwest. How did your grandfather make the run? Uh, it was in a wagon. In a wagon? Yes. This it's is Grandfather Long? Yes. How much Grandfather Long is? Do, we don't know anything about Grandfather Long because he just stayed a short time, and we really didn't know that that land was his until my brother got to looking up the Lonis side of the family, and it traced it back down there because Grandpa Lonis only stayed, I think, a little over a year on that claim. He went up to uh, Ponca City, took a job there, carrying mail from the post office to the depot. Did you know your grandfather Long, John Long? I didn't know him, no. I knew a grandmother Long. What about her, the grandmother? Uh, she was a large lady, uh, uh, very community-minded, very active, and uh, the, her, her, my cousin, uh, 
still lives on the place that they took there. She was a good cook, and uh, she and uh, a lady of the name of uh, oh, what was their name? Now lived across the river. Uh, they're still on the old homestead over there, Don. Uh, I'll think of it in a little bit, but uh, the, they were great friends, and Becky was her first name, and uh, the two families stretched a wire across the riverbed so that they could have a telephone talk because they had to drive. It was only a mile from one place to the other, but they'd have to drive to get to there. They'd have to drive clear around uh, four miles this way or four that way to get across the river. And uh, they had one the, a private line across there, and they'd use a hairpin to connect it up with the regular telephone lines. And they could call each other and talk and enjoy it very much. Uh, where did your grandfather get the medicines right. after the run that he dispensed to the, the people? The, the government furnished the medicine, furnished the beans and the salt pork. And uh, I do remember the family telling me, of course, I have to go back to the remembrances. Uh, <coughs> the black community was starving, and many of the whites, and they would come there for rations. And it's up to him to determine whether they were sick and needed medicine, because medicine, quinine, was very scarce in those days. And uh, the medicine that he had available as issued he had to fix it so that he could give them meat or salt pork and beans. But everybody that's really hungry thinks they're sick too. And they are mentally sick, possibly. So in order to satisfy that uh, uh, condition, Grandpa would uh, take tapioca pills, that's the large tapioca, and soak it in red liniment. And when these people that was coming was just starving, he would give them these pills to take twice a day, made out of tapioca, and issue them some salt pork and beans, and have them come back when that would run out. And I remember him telling about one fellow that come back, and uh, he was quite witty, a black man, and uh, grandfather thought a lot of him, but he, he was a joke too. And so grandpa looked him over and decided that he needed some more of those red pills. And he waited just a little bit and finally says, Ma's long, says, has you got any more of that salt pork and beans? Says, we's run out at our house. Well, he of course was going to issue to him, but he would issue these uh, red pills, and he says, those pills sure are hot, but they're sure doing the job. But if you were sick, if you determined, he'd use quinine and the other medicine that he had in those days that the government allowed him and furnished him. How did your grandfather become the agent to dispense the medicine? Uh, he studied in, in Ohio, in Oberlin College, Ohio. Studied uh, to be, become a doctor. Did he volunteer to, uh, you know, dispense medicine for the uh, pioneers? That, that part I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I presume that uh, when, that it was known after he had staked the claim that uh, he started the, the first year, it wasn't so bad, but I presume this, when the thing began, he began to get medicine and uh, somebody connected with the government knew that and found out who he was, and, and he took care of that whole area up there around Banner Cemetery, Banner Community. Went flew over to Excelsior, and went north, and around there. Any stories your grandmother told you about, you know, pioneer life after the run? You know, how, what kind of house they live in? Well, I, I, I remember the house. Of course, the first house that, that I remember the house they had a house with uh, two rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs. Really, it wasn't two rooms. The upstairs was open, 
but it had a curtain going. And I stayed there as a child when my grandmother still lived there, and Uncle Charlie lived there. They uh, had a, uh, an ideal location. They were just below a little hill uh, going into the flat that led clear down to the riverbed. And there was a spring there. They dug this spring out and uh, rocked it up, and they made a milk house out of it, and they kept all of their uh, foods and stuff out there in that uh, spring-fed uh, water that was going through this trough, and all their stuff was kept cool. And coming from up in the flat country up here in Grant County, I thought that was really something to, to have that cool milk and everything else, because they had that spring water running around it to cool it off. And, uh, but everybody uh, liked grandmother because she was an outgoing individual. And she, in the later years that I saw her when I was a kid, uh, she'd come to our house and stay. She did not uh, have teeth. She'd had them removed, but she didn't like the false teeth, so she did without them. So to enjoy an apple, she'd have to scrape it. And she'd scrape that apple, and about ever so often, we kids would get some of our scrapings. <laughs> and your father was born on a plane? No, no. Let me see. No, no father was born back east. Back east, in yeah. Ohio, that's right, yeah. that's right. Um, so your grandfather was a doctor. Yes. And what type of work did your father do? Uh, father uh, was a farmer. And uh, that's all he did was farming. He'd move. And uh, a group of the people settled up here in Ellsworth, Kansas. I mean, not they settled in Ellsworth, then moved down to Anthony. And uh, now Grandfather Long's brother was David Burton Long, who also settled in Ellsworth. And he was a pioneer. Now, I've got a story of that that was uh, he wrote of his mem memorial of the early day and the Indians and fighting the Indians and like that in Kansas. I've got that story that he wrote that's been published. And he moved out in western Kansas, and he was quite an agriculturalist while Grandpa w went for medicine. Now, did your father come down to old Oklahoma with your grandfather? Yes, he was there, but he didn't, uh, just in the wagon is all. He didn't stay on the plane, though. He no. went to Kansas. He went back to Kansas. And uh, we do not know uh, definitely where mother and dad met. But we do know that where they was married there. But they, uh, their first two children were born in Harper County, Kansas. And the rest of us was born in Grant County. Why did your grandfather make the run? Why? Mm -hmm. A pioneer. Just pioneering, getting a new home, coming, going west, and uh, he brought his family. Now the grandfather Lonus, they came west, and I do have uh, some uh, information on grandfather Lonus coming west with the wagon, and uh, they uh, had a milk cow that they brought with them. They put a bell on the milk cow, and that milk cow fed the calves fed the children when they come to the West. They had fresh milk every day, twice a day. And uh, I, I had the cowbell that was on that cow. Now the reason that I'm talking to the grandfather Lawrence and grandmother Lawrence, when I was a kid I used to stay with them at Ponca City where he carried the mail from the depot to the post office and the post office to the depot and met all the trains. That was his job, seven days a week meet all the trends. Did they give any specific stories about the wagon trip to Oklahoma, the grand grandparents, Lomas? Uh, no, nothing, only uh, the, the food and the trouble that they had in keeping food for children. Uh, but uh, and, uh, but they, they think that the best thing that they had was this cow that they brought along with them that kept the kids the milk, that they always had good milk. Do they say any specific items that they packed to 
bring to Oklahoma in the wagons? Uh, what were the family packs when they were coming to the new country? Well, they, they packed everything they had, which was not very much. You, nowadays, you'd pack it in one of these extended the suitcases that we have. But they uh, they had their clothing and uh, some of the things that they had now. Grandpa Lonis packed his gun, of course, and uh, I fell heir to it. And uh, they, they just they just kept moving forward. I don't know of anything that they had they packed. Of course, now I can recall more of Grandpa Lonis and 101 Ranch. And uh, he was associated with those people there at the 101 Ranch very much because they all came to Ponca City to board the train and to leave the train. And he knew old 101 himself, and they all called uh, Grandpa Uncle Sam. And, and I was there in the summertime, they, they called me Uncle Sam's kid. I got, I got the benefits of being grand, uh, Uncle Sam's kid because when it come time for the 101 Ranch show and all of that, I, I had access to the show. I could just go. I do remember one time at that show uh, that they uh, wanted uh, had a saddle, and then they had a rope. They had a saddle in the middle and then a rope around it. It's great just this room, I'd say, uh, eight, ten feet each side of the saddle. And uh, they wanted me to stand guard to that saddle, and I wasn't to do anything. But if anybody got inside that rope, I was to scream. That's all I was supposed to do. Because it's, the saddle was studded with jewels. And, uh, and all saddle's on display now. Yes. It's in the Warwalk Museum. Yeah. And all I was supposed to do was to stand there, and if anybody got inside the rope, I was to scream. And, but he had, uh, they had a lot of uh, good acts. You know, the 101 Ranch show. Later on, when I was going to college, I got acquainted with little Joe Miller. He and I were in classes together. In fact, at the Animal Science building down there at Stillwater, uh, when it was first completed, the first part of it, we had a rodeo, and little Joe brought down the Arabian tumblers from his uh, the Miller Ranch show, and he brought them down and entertained us. What year was that? That would be 1923 or four. Before we go on there, yeah. um, why did your father make the run of 93? Uh, new land. Land. Yeah, because uh, Dad was working. Now, we don't know who he worked for, possibly some of the family, because the Lonis family had a half section of land uh, three, four, three or four miles north of the state line. And uh, Bluff City, Kansas, and Anthony was centers of uh, that the people, agriculture people, traveled to those places. If you're selling grain, you went to Bluff City. If you went to a, a big reunion, you went to Bluff City. And I can remember it was still was a big reunion there for Decoration Day and Memorial Days, uh, the big holidays in the summertime. They had, uh, well, they had the governor of, uh, uh, of Kansas would be there to talk. People, the highest officials they had would just look forward to coming to Bluff City because they'd get to meet the largest group of people that there were. Well, that was in my time. I was just a child about old 10, 12 years of age when that was going on. And How did your father make the run? Uh, they, uh, some discussion, my brother thinks he was a horseback. I think he was in a wagon because uh, Bill does not recall Dad plowing the first day but Dad told me he plowed a fur around the field the first day. And I think since he only went one mile and is going to camp there that night, I think he took a team of horses in his wagon. And his brothers was with him and all, and they camped together that night. Did the Allstate Flames 
the Allstate claims, three of them, one right after the other. And the one, uh, one did not get the claim because uh, uh, a friend of my mother's that had gone to school with her in Kansas uh, knew where mother was going to be, so she goes down to Enid and uh, she takes the claim, she goes in the back door and files on the claim next to mother's. So Uncle Joe didn't get his claim. But that, that was the custom then, is to let the women uh, file first. And she found out where Mother uh, was going to live, so she filed on the one right next to her. Any trouble with sooners in that area? Uh, not up in that area, because it was mostly plain. There wasn't too many trees. There was not, now you get in south, I hear of them, down around the river. And uh, some um, possibly Crooked Creek, but not much. I don't. Uh, I never heard him talk about Sooners up there at all. There's a lot of people knew the land, knew exactly where they wanted to go, and Dad knew exactly the, the place that he wanted to go. He knew where the corner stone was and all. And how did he know where he wanted to go? Well, he just lived four miles away from it, and uh, he liked the lay of the land. He liked the land that that was around it and that laid level. And uh, uh, then it uh, also might have been something they liked. The school land was catty cornered from ours, the school land section. And it might have been that he had an idea that he could take and get some of that land to farm in time. I, I don't know why. But this one place he knew, and I think, the, I believe the legal description is 22297. But it, he knew exactly where the, the rock was that had the information on Noel. And his brothers was there, and they all went to Enid together. Um, what type of house did Father build on the plane? Uh, the first house that he built there, he never built a sod house. first house was a sideboard house, one by twelves, up and down, with a one by four over the crack. That I board in the back? Yeah. And uh, that uh, that house was possibly uh, 12 by 18. And, uh, Were you we, born in that house? I, uh, I was not born in that house. They had built another house after that. Uh, he immediately used that house, and then they started building the other house that had the two rooms to it. And it was a conventional style house. And, uh, that's where I was told that I was born, and I think that's correct. As a young boy, what chores did you do in the farm? Uh, the chores we did there was to get up and go milk and come to the house for breakfast then. This was all done, and you, you milked always by uh, lantern light, whether it's in the morning or in the evening. Because in the evening you milked by lantern light so the flies wouldn't bother you. But that uh, enables you to get in a full day's work. As I got older, well, we found out we could milk, and one of us shoe the flies, and the other milk, and then we got the stanchions for the cows to come in the barn to milk, and we could spray them a little bit and milk there in the barn in the stanchions, and it was a little different story. But the early day, we milked by lantern light. How many cows did you milk? We milk uh, usually about six. Six. And how long would that take to milk the six cows? Well, uh, it's according to how many of us milking. I talked to a fellow here the other day. They milked 36 cows, but the six of them milked them. And uh, so each one had to milk six. But you take uh, uh, usually feeding the cows and milking. We always figured that was a half hour to 45 minutes time. I would give mother time to get breakfast while we was doing the milking and feeding the horses. After breakfast, what'd you do? Then uh, was to get up and get the field. Whatever was work that was being done, to get out there and get that job done at the field. And that could, could work until noon and come back in and water the horses and feed them and eat dinner. Then you could go and lay down and take a nap 
one o'clock he got up and started again. What was the main crop you raised for those early Wheat. Wheat. We did have corn um, and uh, milo maize. It wasn't the dwarf type. It was the milo we raised then was head high. And uh, uh, corn was, uh, we'd take corn and if it didn't make, uh, it got the hot summer, or we'll put it in a silo. And uh, we'd always fill corn just about uh, the first, sep first of September. That's about the time, or in August and September, if the corn started to, uh, you saw it wasn't going to make good corn, well, you put it in a silo. And we always raised a, a one field crop to put in a silo for feeding the cattle. But wheat was our main, our main crop. It was, uh, uh, we of course, all of it was done with horses when I was a kid, and uh, we never had a tractor until I was in college. But How many acres of wheat did you plant in those years? Well, it would be, uh, I, I would say possibly uh, 80 to 100 acres of wheat. How long would it take to plow the fields to get ready for 80 acres? All, all summer. Uh, I can remember plowing out there with horses that uh, uh, we plow and the, you'd have to take the plowshares off every um, half day, take them to town and have them sharpened. And somebody would do that while you put on the other set and plow the afternoon. And we put on the fresh set the next day. And uh, that was a uh, this area up there that I was very fortunate in living in that area because there was a lot of pioneering done. And uh, uh, following the horse plowing, I can remember the first time we got a plow that uh, you lifted with your feet out of the ground. Up to that time, you take it, go around and had three levers that you'd pull down to raise the plow up out of the ground. Well, this one had a foot lift and one lever and you take and brace your feet and one crank this way and one that way and pull the lever back and raise it out of the ground. Uh, that uh, Then we went into the tractor farming, but horse farming was uh, very essential in those days and breeding good horses was a, a must. And the fellow who lived west of us was a horse dealer, a trader they called him. And he bought and sold horses all the time and when I was too small to work, we, he'd come by and pick me up and take me with him when he was going to buy horses. And then if he had a bulky one that wouldn't lead home, I had to walk behind that horse and keep it up to the buggy. I remember one time that I brought uh, the horses home and he walked possibly three or four miles that day and uh, got home and Frank Gillespie gave me three little pigs uh, for pay. And uh, I went home and that made Dad mad because he hadn't given me a quarter to give me those little pigs. Well, that was prior to World War One, And I uh, took these pigs and Dad was mad because Frank was a pretty good friend of his, but a kid was a kid. He wasn't worth much 25 cents a day so about all his work. And uh, Dad says, uh, that old cheapskate give you those pigs. It was going to die anyhow. Well, we nursed them and we got two of them to live. And when I got ready to sell them, we'd feed them the, the stuff that come out of the kitchen. Instead of the, in those days, you see, we had no way to put it down the sewer. We had to take them out. And I took all of the grub and stuff come out of the kitchen and grain from the uh, downtown, down to the bins. Well, those pigs got up and got fat and during World War I, and that one pig made me almost a hundred dollars. And that sure did hurt Frank Gillespie to think that he paid me a hundred dollars to drive that one bunch of horses home. But you say there weren't many trees up in that area? No, there still is not very many trees. What type of fuel did you use in the house to cook with and eat the house? Uh, we used uh, corn cobs and coal. We had the 
the uh, corn cobs, of course, come from the shelling of corn, and uh, nearly every farmer had a, uh, a high fence, about 10 foot high, that would go around the enclosure, and he'd fill that thing full of corn cobs, and you'd take corn cobs in, and, uh, but for your good heat was coal. Coal wasn't uh, very high, I think, around $10 a ton would buy you good coal. Now, later years, we had what we call a base burner, which used anthracite coal. And the coal would come in from the top and burn out at the side and burn up in the ising glass around it, or for my mica of some kind. You can see the fire in there and everything. Made a nice, good heat. All the, and you put a bucket full of coal and it'd burn all night long. If you didn't ventilate it too much, you could shut it down. And as you let the air to it, that's what caused it to use more coal. Now, would you burn the coal with the uh, corn cobs? Uh, some, yes. Now, the, uh, the, if you wanted a quick fire, you used the corn cobs. We had, uh, behind the cook stove, we'd always have what we call the cob box. Now, the very little wood that, that you burn because we just didn't have it. Now, did you start the coal fire with corn cobs first? Yes, uh, or, or some small wood that you had around. Mm -hmm. But you're, you usually, uh, you take corn cob and get it started, you just, or some kindling wood, and you can start it up, and get a pretty, pretty good fire, and you put the coal in, and it'll last. Of course, your coal, could, you could bank it and keep it all night, and then the next morning all you'd have to do is give it a little air, and it'd take off. Where did you start school? Where did they start school? Yes. Victor Schoolhouse. Victor Schoolhouse. Yes. Which is located where? Uh, well, uh, it's located, uh, would be a half mile south of Manchester and uh, four miles east. You see, the schoolhouses there was every three miles. How far from the house to the school? A mile and a half. Mile west to half south of our place. And was the one room school? One room schoolhouse. How? Eight grades. Eight grades. How did that teacher handle all eight grades in one room? Masterfully. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for students to learn. A lot of people think that it was a handicap, but the little kids, uh, the big ones sat at the back and the little ones in the front because of the for some reason, and I guess it's possibly right, they started the little chairs in front, the little desk, the big ones at the back, and uh, they, then as they come up to recite, children, you get to hear what the big kids said. And you got, uh, you got uh, and not only studying your own studies, when you had time to study, but you could listen to what the others were reciting and doing. And their spelling contests, and. The, the spelling classes and math, and it was a wonderful way to teach. I think we're doing a good job now, but uh, uh, the, a child that might have dropped out in the fifth or sixth grade could have had an eighth grade education, because they, if they listened, it was all going on right there before them in that one-room schoolhouse. They did have some problems, older kids, and uh, I remember uh, our district got out of hand. We had a group of people come in and work for the Cannon Lynch Ranch. And uh, that was a, a big ranch that is on the Kansas line, just a mile north, a mile and a half north of the schoolhouse. Well, they employed, uh, I don't know how many people, I had 18 rooms in their house. And he uh, moved cattle from Mexico up, fed in the Cherokee Strip, pastured there, and then shipped on to St. Louis. Well, there were some of the people that came in there to working for him. They got a little uncontrolled. They came from Tennessee. And uh, there was about uh, six or eight years behind the rest of us. And there's one boy in particular that gave them trouble. And uh, they hired a, a man teacher one year. And Jess Swayze came in there. And in one year's time, he straightened that school out. 
What games did you play in school? Oh, uh, shimmy. Uh, shimmy, you took an old tin can and beat it up until it was a ball, and you got uh, uh, a crooked stick, somewhat like a golf club. You get it off of, uh, mainly those is off of uh, the uh, hedge trees that we had planted in rows. And you'd go in there and find you a hedge tree that come out about so far and turned up, and that'd make you a shinny club. And you'd go out and beat that beat the can, and you'd beat that back and forth. Uh, and it's shinny on your own side, you you wouldn't get on the other side because you'd have to get hit. And uh, I remember one time that a boy, I just looked up, and a boy that got a good strike at a shinny club, and that tin can hit me right here in the eye. I still got the scar. And, of course, they sent me home. Everybody thought my eye was out. I got home. Mom washed it up. Come out, and I went back to school. She taped it up. But when I got home, I had my whole hand full of blood. The boy had just cut this little eyelid. And that would slow us up a little bit. But Shinny, and uh, I do remember when we got our first basketball, uh, was outside. Now he got it up there and put up a hook in the backboard to play basketball. And that was about all we played double dare and dare base. It was double dare. No. And uh, uh, I can't remember all the games we played, but that, it was just running games all we had. It was a little baseball, not too much baseball, because you had the small and then up to big. and but on. You get in your dare base and stuff like that, the little kids could run and sneak around the others about as well as anybody. Yeah. What kind of mischief did you get into in school? Oh, uh, I don't remember uh, all, all the things that we did get into. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot except to tease the girls. I've heard a lot of stories earlier than I was when they first started the school there because there was some black students who went to school there for about four or five years from after the opening. But uh, usually the things that you did was teach the girls. What did you do at Halloween? Uh, upset uh, outhouses. And uh, uh, you would uh, get on, cover up with the sheep, go around and, and take pumpkins and cut faces in it. I remember when I was a kid that we had built this new two-story house and uh, our dog began to bark and we couldn't figure out what was happening. The old bullet was raising cane and I heard somebody talk to him and he quieted down. And about that time, up in the second-story house, here come a pumpkin face up there on a stick. Somebody put it up or had a candle in it. But, yeah, we, uh, we had, uh, uh, remember, I wasn't in it, I was too young. It seemed like the, uh, most of the mischievousness happened when my older brothers was, they took a buggy down, uh, Gibbon, and put a, a buggy up on top of the church and put it back together, the buggy wheels and all. And, uh, when the fellow, Got up the next morning, there was his buggy over there up on top of the church. And uh, and the buggies, they uh, they taken the change the wheels around and or take the nuts off so that they'd lose a wheel on the way home, stuff like that. What about Christmas? Christmas? Yeah, we always had Christmas at these schoolhouses. Uh, this lady across uh, the road now, Mr. Pinky was her name, and they had one child. And I remember he was had the Christmas toy that was the envy of all children as well as adults. Where she got it, how she bought it, nobody knows. But it had a, a steamboat. I would say it was about 18 inches long. And everything in it was wonderful. And it was just the envy of everybody in the community, that steamboat, that ship that he got. 
But the odd thing about it was that he got it for the next three years every Christmas. She'd take it home, put it up, and wouldn't let him play with it. And then the next year he'd bring it. But uh, that was just one of the things that I do remember Christmas time. What kind of uh, toys did you receive for Christmas? Well, uh, I can't remember and recall any, any specific toys right now that I received. I, I don't recall that. Of course, we all got candy and we got uh, uh, usually clothing, uh, more than toys, but then this one boy got this uh, boat. Well, that was the envy of everybody because the toys we got was insignificant as compared to this 18-inch tin boat. Was there a Christmas tree at the school? Yes, always a Christmas tree. They, had, uh, the, uh, they didn't cut down a tree. They took a, a stump and then they cut off tree limbs of evergreen and made a tree. What kind of decorations? Uh, usually popcorn and uh, rings made out of little uh, pieces of paper was the decoration usually that they had. Did you have a tree at the house? Yes, uh, just a small tree. Yeah. Mother always decorated it up with popcorn, string popcorn on a string, decorated all through the, the tree. About Fourth of July. Fourth of July was uh, right in the middle of harvest, and we didn't get to celebrate very much in the Fourth of July because it was right in either harvest or the thrashing. Now they might. Uh, we might have some, but we never went very much on the 4th of July. And uh, Labor Day was another one that was supposed to be a holiday, but that was nearly always the day that somebody started filling silo. And so uh, we was on Labor Day. We didn't have a day off. That was back there in, in the last of August, and that was time to be filling silos. And when you started filling silo and the, the corn was burning, you didn't stop. Thanksgiving. Uh, nothing, nothing big. Just at home, pumpkin pie. So the biggest holiday Christmas. was Christmas. Christmas, yes. Okay. You mentioned wagons. How many wagons did you have in the Well, the, the everything was carried by. Uh, horses, that was moved by horses. That was our transportation, that was a, the thing that moved everything, and each farmer would have him a, a, a header barge, or two header barges, usually one header barge was essential because that was the way you put up grain. And then you'd have, uh, later years, you had what they called a hay rack that you'd haul bundle grain on. Then you'd have a spring wagon or light stuff, then the, or what you could ride, and then you'd have the lumber wagons, and usually about two lumber wagons to a farm. What brand were they? Do you remember? Um, uh, I can't think of anything right now. Of course, the uh, first thing I go back is John Deere wagon, because we have got a John Deere wagon. And uh, there was another mate there that was. Studebaker. Yeah, Studebaker White. That was buggies then, Studebaker buggies. Yeah. And they had, uh, you'd have uh, Surrey. Uh, I remember going to uh, Decoration Day. Now we could all go to Decoration Day because it's too early for harvest. And uh, going to Decoration Day to Bluff City, Kansas. And we went up in our Surrey. There was a few cars at that time. Not very many. The old side bush car was there, and John Cliff had that in his uh, livery stable. And a bunch of us kids slipped out from uh, the festivities down at the park, and we'd take and push each other around in this car. One fellow scared, the others we couldn't crank it, thank goodness. But we'd push that around in that livery stable and enjoy the time. And that one day, Dad traded Surrey's with John Cliff. And um, uh, Dad was late, late, 
late and it began to get dark and uh, mother was anxious to go home and dad didn't seem to be in a hurry at all to go home even though we didn't have that new surrey and all of us was anxious to ride in it but when it got long it's 10 mile ride home from love city and we got uh, uh, the horses hitched up and got out possibly about three miles from Bluff City, it turned dark. And Dad said, whoa, stopped the horses and got out and he lit the kerosene lights at the side of the Surrey. He wanted to drive the style. That was the reason he stayed until he's late. And everybody the whole way home that night, all of the dogs in the whole country barked at us. We had the attention of everybody. And he was as proud of those lights as could be. What maintenance did you have to perform to keep the wagons, surreys, and buggies? Well, uh, the, and the wagons, you, you had to grease the wagons regular, and uh, the buggies had to be greased. We've got a uh, buggy jack up here now that my son bought in Wyoming. The, there's various types of jacks, and you jack that wheel up, take a wheel off, and you had black beauty axle grease, and you Raise that bug in, you take off. Now we all uh, all had some fair driving horses, but nearly every horse that every farmer that had a driving horse had to also be a horse that you could use on a cultivator. He might not be a plow horse, but he had to be uh, a horse that you could use because uh, a horse had to be diversified. Now, the few of them had saddle horses, and uh, Dad uh, was uh, uh, a promoter and, and good horses in our area. In fact, he had a stud horse and a jack that he stood, and uh, we uh, neighbors would come in and breed their horses there, and because of this perching horse and this uh, jack that we had, the jack turned out to be when we finally traced him down, when we bought him, Dad bought him, I should say, uh, he bought him from a fellow who became an alcoholic and didn't take care of the jack at all. And his feet had grown out to where the hook was about a foot and a half long. And Dad hauled him home, and he had to throw him, and then began to saw off that foot. And he got it sawed off enough, it saw off until it hit soreness or quicksand. And then they'd take a weight and saw off a little more. Finally, they built a pair of shoes on him, and he stood that jack, and he got some of the finest uh, coats that he was in the country, and had people that all wanted to breed to him. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, he went to uh, Kansas City and studied artificial inseminating and, uh, and the diseases of broodmares, and he was standing on twice a week he'd breed mares and my job when I got old enough and got the curiosity I wondered why the people was coming there and finally mother and dad decided that I found out afterwards that it was time for me to be a part of the help down there instead of trying to get a peek through the crack and uh, I uh, he told me and they had a, a dark room that he built down at the shed where he's behind the barn where he used that for the reading purposes. And uh, I had a, a copper boiler in there with a two burner stove on it. And we'd get that water boiling. And I had a thermometer in one hand that I could read it. And I had the bulb that he collected the semen would be in the other hand. And it's my job to keep the temperature exact on those two. So, so, and he'd come in and take that bulb and fill a capsule and he'd go back and capsule the mare then. And uh, it was my job to keep that. Before that, though, he'd always uh, take his, uh, when he got the semen out, he'd put it on a slide and get the microscope and see that the sperm was all alive and everything was okay. One, one time we bred 18 mares there in one day. And I was telling a group the other day about it, and the one fellow said, now, Bill, Dad got ready to the mare that he's going to use, 
was a matter that was general, very general and all, and uh, uh, he had get the recover the semen from her. And this man said, "No, Bill says you're going to you're not going to do that with my mare. Says uh, you're going to breed my mare artificial, regular, not artificially." That's your one. Uh, why not? Well, he says, Bill says, I, you're just going to let that stud cover my mare. That will, well, it's just as easy one way or the other, and I was using this mare because she was gentle. But he says, Bill, what if that uh, uh, colt didn't get out of that capsule? Says that you, you're just going to breed mine naturally, and he would, he never would let Dad use a capsule on his mare for fear that colt couldn't get out of the capsule. Well, I, I thought of that. There's that farmer, and that's all of he knew about the sperm, and all he knew about the breeding of animals was that capsule was that colt was in that capsule when he put him in there. Well, then we went through that period of time. Then back a little later on when Blizzard uh, wanted some uh, semen from overseas to breed to a mare, and there was a stud horse over there that he wanted to purchase a stud horse he wanted this mare bred to. And they sent a fellow over to France, and they uh, collected semen, and they take it under a man's arm and flew him back, and the semen was still alive, and they bred this mare at Stillwater. Well, that, uh, that seemed to be quite an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays, we take that same semen and we freeze it, and you can keep it from centuries on. In fact, we're getting some embryos right now to get some calves that uh, where we had collected these embryos and washed the cow out and got the embryos and we froze them and we've got three calves just the other day from uh, embryo transplants. How long can they keep the embryo? Oh, you can keep it a uh, century or two. There's, uh, if it's frozen, there's no, there's no limit to time. We're having a dispersal of our cattle, registered cattle this year, and uh, they um, we will sell the semen from three or four different bulls that we have semen collected. We'll sell that semen, and they'll just take it and transfer it over to their tank. And there's no, no telling how long that will be good. Um, let's get back to maintenance in the wagons. Okay. Uh, how'd you keep the tires tight on the wagon? Uh, the way you kept the tires tight on the wagon was to uh, uh, shrink the steel and uh, you take they have a, a shrinker now some people could hammer it but usually you took your wagon wheel to town and uh, they were taking heat it and they'd squeeze this wagon tire together then you'd heat the whole wagon tire you'd get all of the fellas around the wheel would be in good shape and the size until you couldn't get the wagon wheel on it. Then you'd heat it, and it'd expand, and you'd put it on, and then cool it. If you lost the tire, the rim. Well, your, your wheel broke down. You just didn't dare to lose it, because there's nothing to hold the wheel again. And uh, that's the same thing on the buggy. Uh, they uh, sometimes had in the, in the buggies had a little where the fellows would come around that have a little clamp here that keep it from sliding if it got a little dry and dried out. But usually you had to depend on that, that tire being tight. Now to take the tire off, uh, you had to get your your fires built around here and lay the wheel on the inside, let the heat, and it began to heat and it ease up. You could take it off the, off the wheel, the tire, the steel tire. Your first car. Where did you see your first car? Uh, first car was Studebaker. You used to ask when I saw my first one. The first car I saw 
was when the kid, I don't know the make of it, was a side cranker, and the people the name of um, Fling had it. And they came out to where we was, uh, two families was together. They came out for family dinner, and uh, Mr. Fling would take us a riding in that car. He'd take us a half mile down, and they'd turn around in the field and then come back up to where they were. And uh, they, uh, they'd keep the kids from falling out. They'd take one kid and two adults on each side because it's just an open buggy with this here crank crane in it. I don't remember exactly what it had the steering wheel had the, it seems like it was two, two levers here that they had to steer, but I do remember the old car. Later on I saw it, I'm tracing why I didn't go up there and save it, I could have done it. That old car rotted down out there in some trees up there at Manchester. What did you think about that car when you first saw it? Oh, that was, that was something. Because we got to ride a half mile in. Uh, I thought that they said it was for safety that the <coughs> two adults would go and then one child in between. But the, the real truth of the matter was the adults wanted to ride. <laughs> it just took longer to get the job done. <coughs> then the uh, next car, <coughs> I can remember the old Stanley steamer coming into our place one day. They run out of water. And, uh, they had plenty of fuel, but they didn't have any water, and they had to get water and fill up. And when they got that thing, got steam back up, they took off. Uh, our first car was a Studebaker EM and F. And uh, I was getting larger, older. There had been some Overlands sold in our neighborhood, but Dad decided on a Studebaker, and it had uh, the carbide lights with a container on the side of the car and the, the carbide lights in front. Brass from the windshield down to the fenders to hold the windshield up. And of course your top laid down. Then the next car after that was a Ford. We've had Fords ever since. What about World War One? Did you do any work for the war effort? Uh, World War I, uh, the only thing I could do uh, at that age was uh, just work around the home and we did uh, do some sacrificing that they did. I recall that they are, at that time, we had built this house that had eight rooms in it, four downstairs and four upstairs. And uh, the uh, we had a flower compartment above the stairway and sugar. And Dad always took his wheat to town and uh, would make it into flour and bring it back out. We'd take it upstairs. And he had that cedar line to keep moths out. And also, that's where we kept a sugar well. When World War I broke out, I had to help Dad carry that downstairs because they the army had called for it to be brought back in. And he was on his way to town. One fellow said, Bill, what are you doing? And he had a hundred pounds of sugar and uh, this stack of flour. He says, well, they called for it in. Well, he says, uh, I'm going to keep mine. I raised it and it's my, my flour. And the next day he hauled his to town too. <laughs> uh, because they had, uh, the people in those days, uh, you didn't have so much government. The community people uh, had a big influence on that, like I was mentioning to you before, the Anti-Horse Thief Association that I uh, read about in 1902. They were very active back in those days, and those people would get together, and uh, it was a pretty hard job for you to stand up, but maybe two of them would call on you, say, I think you better do this or better do that, and Usually you did it because they knew that they represented all of the neighbors around you. And uh, I do remember Dad taking that because I had to help carry that flower downstairs and it looked foolish to me, but Dad was very patriotic and he bought his uh, bonds and he bought what money he had. And the 
and we raised and worked for the government during the war. school? Work for the war effort in the school? Uh, they, uh, I don't recall as, as such, I recall the first uh, army. I was going to school at Manchester uh, when the armistice was signed. And the next year I was going to Waukegan. And we thought it ought to be a holiday. And uh, so the four of us boys made it a holiday. And the next day, for us to get back in school, uh, the superintendent uh, insisted that every parent had to bring their child back to school. They couldn't be admitted without the parent being there. And that was eight miles and a half from my parent to go, and that's the last time I ever played hooky. Were there many Germans that lived in that area? Not, uh, not in that area, no. Not very, there's more Czechs, more Bohemians. I was going to ask, was there any prejudice toward the Germans during the war? Not, not, uh, no, I don't recall any up there. I don't recall any of the prejudice of the Germans. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have been a farmer, mainly? Yes, been the farming and farming. I'd like to get the background on the Anti-Horse Thief Association. What brought into existence? What? Well, uh, the existence came uh, of the Anti-Horse Thief Association, and it came back when we had uh, the uh, thieving rings was running wild. The Doolins and uh, all of your horse thief groups or bank robbers and like that, there was horse thieves in every community. In old Oklahoma, there was one. And uh, I remember one time there's a family down there was stealing chickens and stealing everything. And uh, my brother was down there visiting Uncle Charlie, and the bunch of them went out to ride and invite this group to leave the community. Well, they did, and uh, the, uh, that, that's just the way they went. They'd go out, and if you wasn't wanted, well, you soon found out, and you just didn't steal very much because they, everybody was getting. Now, they worked with the sheriff. But in uh, where I live, it is 24 to 30 miles from the sheriff's office to where we lived. Well, uh, you, you couldn't depend on the sheriff getting there. And in fact, you still can't do too much out in the rural area because they like to be in the office. But uh, the, uh, so these people got together and organized the Anti-Horse Thief Association, which later became and a thief association. And they would meet, and they had initiation services very much like the modern woodman had. They'd have pranks and everything else and a lot of fun with that. But then you took your turn of writing. I can remember when I was a small child uh, that one night it was Dad's turn to ride. So what do you mean ride? It, he got on the horse and he took a shotgun and he went out and he rode up and down the, the country roads and uh, to see that nobody was there that shouldn't be there. And you had to defend yourself and you went out and uh, uh, later years, of course, you could take a car. The people uh, down here at Crescent, there was a fellow down there the other day that met me and says, I remember Lloyd, when it was my turn to ride the community, and said what we did is we drove up and down the roads and we'd take a turn, and there was a, a car to go another direction. We'd turn the light off, then back up to the corner and sit there to see whether something else showed up. But we, if there was a stranger in the country, well, we would road, uh, we'd drive up until we could get his tag number. And uh, they would, uh, they were just alert all the time, and they'd ride the country road. Somebody, if there was stealing going on, you take Easter Perry. When I was a member of the Anti Thief Association, we had a very good, the, the uh, sheriff there was a very good uh, sheriff, and he's a member of the Anti Thief Association. He used it. One morning he got a call east of Perry that uh, there's a car parked down under a cottonwood tree. Well, it wasn't very long after he got that notice. 
that uh, he was outside of this car. And he went up, and there was a fellow laying down asleep in the back seat of his car. And it was a car with side curtains on. In the back seat was a bunch of gunny sacks. And he didn't wake him up. He just pulled his gun out and fired one shot straight in the air. And that fellow liked to throw up the steering wheel, get him out, and tried to find out what he wanted and everything else. And the sheriff said, well, uh, where you been? What's your name? And so forth. Well, we didn't have to carry identification so much then. You had to depend on a man's word. Because uh, you didn't have Social Security or credit cards. So uh, he took him back to Perry. And the man said, well, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, so what are those gunny sacks in your car for? Well, he says, I've been up helping uh, Kim folks up at Cherokee move. We move the chickens. And that's when he said, well, I think we'd better go inside. And they went inside and Perry. And he says, uh, you say you wasn't stealing chickens? No. Well, he says, how are you going to count for these? And he took two plastic pairs of casts, tire tracks that he had, took out to this fella, says, uh, how, how are you going to count for those tracks if you wasn't stealing chickens? And the fellow confessed that he had stole chickens all over that whole neighborhood down there for years. And all, the oddity was that those tire tracks didn't even match his car. But we got a confession, and that fellow went on to serve his time out in McAllister. But th that's the way that uh, they would that work. If there's any tip or anything else, if there's any car going by at night, nowadays we don't think of it a car going by here. But out there in the farm, a car went by your place after midnight, uh, you knew about it, and you knew exactly what time it was. And those people just worked together and furnished the sheriff information was able to take him to really uh, uh, reduce the How did you join? I joined in 19 and uh, 26, I believe it was. Now, do you have local chapters of the anti- Yeah, there's, uh, it's gone now. It's a thing yeah. of the past. There was local chapters. There's one at the, uh, down at uh, uh, Crescent. There's one... Uh, a big one over at Annecy, Manchester, uh, Perry. Um, well, uh, all in through here are the local chapters. Then the state chapters went in Kansas, and Missouri, and Illinois, and Indiana, part and of Ohio. You joined which chapter? Well, I joined uh, up at Manchester. Manchester. And you said you were national president? At later, uh, later years, yes. What year? That would be in 19 and, uh, gosh, I hadn't thought of that. That would be about 19 and uh, the late 30s. Late 30s? Yeah. What were your duties as president? Well, we, we had our state conventions and then we had our national conventions. My wife and I went to the national convention in Jacksonville, Illinois, and we went with a couple from, uh, uh, out west of Dover, or west of Hennessy, rather. A little town out there, and we rode up with that couple there that was representing our state. And uh, they'd go up there, and then we'd see, have a meeting, just as uh, any other organization did, and we'd make your reports. Uh, one of the big promoters of it was up here in Kansas, was where the paper was published, the news. And uh, out of, and I can't call that town out right now, out of Kansas. Just from Wichita, north and west of Wichita, mainly west of Wichita. Mm -hmm. No, it's a smaller town, a little in there. And, uh, but he was a, an active member in it, and the, they did a lot of good working with the sheriffs, and, and they were, uh, in every community, they were, uh, you might say, the sheriff's outreach. I remember one time that uh, the sheriff in Grant County called, and I was in college at that time, 
he called my dad and they said that there had been a man shot at Waukita. Now this was early in the morning. And uh, said they understood that uh, the fellows that had done the shooting were stealing gasoline, but they escaped on foot. And uh, it wasn't long after that, Dad got another call and said that they were three miles south of our place and headed in our direction. And uh, he told Dad to, uh, to go out there and stop them some way, if he could, until he could get there. So uh, Dad went out and he looked uh, south, and sure enough, about a mile and a half south was uh, two men walking. So Dad uh, went west of our house down to what we call a school land, where he's putting up alfalfa hay. And he got down there and he kept uh, watching these people and timing himself so that he'd meet these people right in front of our driveway. In the meantime, he had me uh, laid down, and I was laying down out there in the cedar trees with a shotgun and a rifle to protect Dad. And I wasn't to do anything unless something broke loose that Dad couldn't handle talking about it. And he met those fellows right in front of me and about or 20 feet from me. And one fellow was very nervous. He kept his hand in his pocket all the time. And the other fellow was uh, more easily to talk to. And Dad said, uh, told him, said, well, uh, you fellows are going somewhere? And, and they said, yes, he's going to Kansas, going to Anthony. And Dad said, well, uh, listen, uh, I've got some alfalfa out here that needs to be put up this morning. I just been down to look at it and says, uh, if you'll uh, help me put this alfalfa up, I'll haul you to Anthony. I'll take you to Anthony. That's 18 miles. And uh, one uh, fellow said, well, that sounds like a, a good thing for me. And uh, the other fellow said, no, says, we can't wait that long. They got to argue between themselves. And Finally, um, uh, Dad saw he wasn't getting anywhere. And one fellow says, well, how far is it to Kansas? And they caught Dad off, and he said, a mile. And immediately they said, well, which way? And Dad pointed west instead of north. And the fellows thanked Dad for uh, offering to take him to Kansas, but says they'd be gone. So they went west. They was walking pretty fast when Dad came in, and when they got about three quarters of a mile west, a little over, to Gillespie's place, here this fellow from uh, the county sheriff showed up, and uh, he says, well, Dad told him what he'd done. Well, he says, thank goodness you didn't send him north. And uh, says, well, Bill, I want you to take uh, your boy here and take this 30 6 rifle which I'd been using at the, the summer camp at the college. And uh, you go around, and they said, Lloyd, now don't, don't you fire unless you have to. Fire one, if you fire, fire above them. But he says, if you have to, fire, uh, fire in the dirt around them so they can hear that bullet sound. He says, you know, stay away from them until I can get there. Now, you folks go a mile north and a mile west and come south, and I'll go straight west here. But we got north car went north and well, we coming south. Well, he, of course, we had three miles to go while he only had one. Well, he got there and they got into the trees of the Glisper place and the Biffle farm. And uh, he lost him in the buildings and all. He's working pretty carefully because he knew his arm. And, uh, we come in and we sat and watched that they didn't come to the north. And a little bit we saw them about an eighth of a mile south of the corner run across the road into an oak feet is in the spring of the year. And uh, we drove down there then and told the sheriff where he, he and his other man that he had was coming out. We told him where we saw him. 
And uh, so he says, okay, let's just go together. I'll go ahead. You folks come behind. We went down, and he got down there to this oak field where we'd seen him cross into it, and it wasn't, it was just uh, about this high, and uh, the, um, the sheriff saw where they crawled through, and he called for him to come out, and one fellow says, you can't do anything to us, we're in Kansas. And he says, well, that's what you think. He says, uh, I'm going to give you a, a count of three, then I'm going to start down if you don't come out. He said, well, you can't do anything to us. Well, the first time he fired just above that oats, which would make it a possibly a foot or two above their heads, well, uh, you begin to see hands coming up. And they come up, and they come across them. And we went out in the oat field and found the gun that they had. And one of the fellows said to Dad, says, you still want to put up that alfalfa? But that was the nearest that I've ever been in a holdup. That's where we had to correct and catch What year was that? What? What year was that? That would be in 1925. Okay. And when was the uh, association disbanded? Uh, really, uh, uh, it grew out of its service in about 1950. Uh, I, I lost track of it because we didn't have a locally here. I belonged to Perry, and I lost track. And uh, a fellow down at Perry, the last fellow that I knew, was active in the late 50s. They were still meeting out there at Bohemian Hall. And well, it was a. Uh more or less a community support group? As a community support group, very, very careful as to who they took in members so that they, could, they knew who they could talk to and who they couldn't talk to. And then in initiation, they, they, they had a lot of pranks and stuff as a modern woodman. But truthfully, it was all surveillance and getting individuals you could depend on and because you was going to depend on them watching your stuff and you watching theirs. And I still think if we had more of that going today, we could eliminate some. But with the modern theater, now we had uh, 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 a semi-trailer, uh, one of these here uh, big long trailers, load, I think it was 18 head of stairs located right here at North End of Main Street. They stole them a year ago right at the North End of Main Street. Loaded them up up there and all. And we couldn't load them up uh, ourselves. We couldn't have done it at all. But these were professionals. They come in and they either had dogs or quiet dogs or something because they only had one one fence line. They just opened the gate, backed up to the corner. Whatever they had, they just drove in till they had the uh, load drove off. And the sheriff uh, was just indifferent about it. He said, oh, you can't find them. And that, that was his... He was unconcerned about it as could be. You mentioned summer camp. Yeah, that was uh, reserve officers. At A&M? Yeah. When did you enter A&M? I went down there in the fall of 22. Fall of 22. And did you live on campus or off campus? I lived uh, off campus one year and on campus the rest of it. I lived uh, in Crutchfield Hall. Crutchfield Hall. Okay. What did you study? I said in animal science. And animal husbandry, they called it then. Mm -hmm. And just would you give me some reflections on A and M in the nineteen twenties? Well, it, there was uh, less than two thousand students there. It seems to me like it's eighteen hundred altogether. And uh, the uh, the clothes that the kids wear nowadays was the clothes that we had to wear in those days, old blue overalls and stuff, that's the best that we have. And nowadays that's uh, the high price clothes. And, uh, but uh, you you could work, we worked down there. I started out at uh, 20 cents an hour and uh, finally got a job at, as a janitor at uh, 25 cents an hour. I'd get two hours a day janitoring down in the machine shop, and 
and through acquaintance I got a job in the home economics building and that paid uh, a nickel an hour more. And on top of that, the, the, if they had a cook uh, class, cooking class, and they had anything left over, they always left it on the windowsill for you to eat. That came in pretty handy. And, but it was, uh, it was a small school. Uh, everybody almost knew everybody. They had uh, a lot of kids who was working uh, the way through school as I was. Uh, uh, the um, Lewis Hawkins later on became vice president of the university. He ran out in the sheep barn, and he had his clothes was hanging on a wall covered with a sheet. And that was all the clothes he had. And then, of course, when they came to church on Sunday morning, that odor came with him. And but Lewis was a fine fellow, but that's the way he had to work his way through school. Uh, a lot of them, Raymond Bivert down there, he deceased now, he worked his way through school washing dishes. Later on, he got up from dishwashing on up to managing the Swim's ca uh, Cafe there. So was that the job he had, was that enough to pay your way through college? Uh, I, I had to borrow money. That's kind of a story of its own. Uh, I had a friend up here at the bank, C.M. Smith, and I borrowed money from him when it run out, and I'd come up and borrow money, and then the next summer I'd work at the thrashing crew and uh, would uh, repay that money. Then the next year I'd go to school with what I had, and I'd borrow money and, and pay that off the next year. After I uh, was a sophomore year as a freshman boy down there, that was about uh, to quit school, and I found out all was wrong. He's eating one meal a day, that's all he had, and uh, uh, he had good grades, but he's hungry. So I knew that I could borrow the money, and I've supported this kid, and got him to finish up that semester, and then afterwards he paid me back. Well, then years later, uh, I told my father I wanted to go down and play football. And uh, so uh, I, he didn't want me to play football. And I finally decided to take agriculture and uh, that was to ease things off. Well, the day we left home, a motorcycle and sidecar, my brother and I, had all our earthly plums in that motorcycle sidecar. We kissed Mother goodbye. Dad come around and shook hands with Bill. He says, if you ever need any money, let me know. He says, don't you ever play a game of football. Well, that was uh, about 120 miles that we argued back and forth going to school on that motorcycle and sidecar about playing football. Well, when I got down there and I was rooming with, uh, in the same rooming house where my brother Bill was, uh, got in to eat at the table where the football players, some of the football players was eating. Mm -hmm. And uh, those football players uh, would weigh 200, uh, 275 pounds. I weighed 158. And uh, Ed Crowley and them, and, uh, they looked pretty big while I got out active in some of the activities on the campus. And there's a fellow by the name of Jack Lincoln that was about my size but could run twice as fast as I could. Well, I soon found out that I wasn't even, all I had football was up in my head. It wasn't my physique at all. So I didn't play football and was satisfied to work through school. Well, I borrowed this money and I'd pay it back. I borrowed it, pay it back. One day, uh, after I got married and moved back up on the farm, CM called me in one day and said, say, I want to talk to you a minute. And I said, sure. Went back to his office. He says, you remember when uh, <coughs> your dad, uh, when you uh, borrowed money off of me and you go to school? I said, yes, and I remember how you had asked me questions, how my grades was and what I did with the money and all. And uh, 
says, I sure did appreciate that, see him, because there wasn't any other kid that I knew of down there that could go and borrow money to go to college on. Well, he says, I think there's one thing you need to know, and that is that all the time that you was borrowing that money and paying it back, your dad had a note back in the back of the bank signed for any amount of money that you borrowed. He guaranteed every dime that you borrowed. <laughs> I didn't know that until after uh, later years yep. when I was down. And I appreciated Dad and what he'd done for me a lot then, but it was just different things. Different kids act different ways. But I did go to school. We uh, ate in the cafeteria my second year. First year, I worked my way for meals. I'd help uh, Mother Stansbury. Bill, Bill got me that job, and I'd help wait tables and wash dishes for my board. So I only had uh, $15 a month for a room. And that got it by in pretty nice shape and with the incidentals. And uh, the, the nowadays, kids just can't do that. And uh, the, uh, at the cafeteria, uh, they got uh, this bunch of us who was hungry, and we couldn't eat. The second year, we couldn't eat what fresh food and everything like they had. Well, they had the leftovers, peach cobbler and apple cobbler, and they had the blackberry cobbler. Those squares they cut. Instead of pie, they cut cobbler. And uh, then they had leftover chicken or whatever it was, and they put it over in a corner table, and they applied these all they could pile on a plate for 15 cents. It's the same thing that you'd had the meal before, but it was cold. And a bunch of us kids and rasters that was down there got to eat in that plate lunch, and they got to be very popular among the rasters and kids working, working their way through school and needed a lot of food and just couldn't afford to buy. And they, a lot of the rasters stayed at what we call the West Dorm which was no armory belly. And they just leap in that big room and uh, they had their cots around there and their clothes hanging on the wall. And uh, they uh, wherever they could get a job to get food, that's where they got through school. Now the, the athletes didn't receive the treatment like they do nowadays. Of course there's a lot of things have changed too besides athletes, but those boys a lot of times was hungry. I remember one time that uh, my freshman year, I had a garden just west of the dorm. And uh, that's right down in the middle of the campus now. But uh, I never did harvest any vegetables off that garden in the spring. Wow. The uh, boys from the dorm, those wrestlers, all ate it. They all got that garden. I never did get any of it. And uh, they, they got hungry for meat. And they occasionally would get a chicken. Well, they went and got a hen one time, but the trouble was they got the wrong hen. She was, uh, the hen was shipped there from back east. She was in the National Egg Laying Contest. And if you don't think that didn't cramp things. Well, I was a sophomore, and I knew what these boys was going through with. And I wasn't involved. They couldn't link me up with it, even though I went to class with them every day. And I knew what had happened. And I went to the dean, and I began to talk to him. We saved those kids embarrassment. Nobody was ever kicked out of school. But it was certainly embarrassing for the college to have college kids steal uh, one of the top hands of the nation. An egg contest. But the, we did get, from that, we did get more food for the boys available. But those boys going out for wrestling and all, and gosh, they just didn't have the food. Good kids come from out in western Oklahoma. Do you attend the sporting events at school? Uh, all of them uh, when I was in school. They have a good wrestling team, football team? They had the, they had the national champion wrestling team. Ed Gallagher was the head of that. And uh, he was an engineer. And he began to come up with ideas of leverages to where you could get advantage instead of just trying to 
hug a fellow and throw him, he became, and he came up, and a lot of the holts they have today were those holts that was designed by Ed Gallagher. And it was uh, up to that time that the wrestling had been more like your pro wrestling, just no rough tumble wrestling. What about the football game between A&M and OU? And him and OU was always a good game. Always, they, they're not as much fighting now as they used in those days. I remember when I was a freshman, OU was playing Stillwater, that'd be a fall of 22. They come up late in the season, and uh, they had their covered wagon, team of horses, and we had wooden stands, of course, didn't have nothing but wood, and uh, they was going to go in, and there was about a hundred of those kids was going to go in with them. And I was on the uh, freshman pep squad, and they called it the Wampus Kittens, and uh, we soon, out of the dorms, and off the campus, we soon had a, a good group assembled to keep them from driving in and taking everybody in free. Oh, there was a little fence there, a hog wire fence about three, four foot high, but they was going to go in with that team of horses. And uh, the, uh, we, we could see it was going to be a bloody battle because uh, everybody's prepared for it. And finally, uh, I being a little chicken, I said, well, why don't we try to negotiate? And uh, we'll let, uh, let the covered wagon go in, but not the students. The upperclassman, uh, he said, well, who wants to stick his neck out and go down there in, in that bunch down there? You, you never know what they're going to do. I said, well, I'll, I'll risk it. And I took another fellow that was willing to try to negotiate, went down, and the fellow that was driving the team on wagon that day was Walter Schelke, a neighbor of mine five miles south of where I was raised. <laughs> he saw me walking up. and. He said, Lloyd, what, uh, what you doing? And I said, well, Walter, uh, they've sent us down here to talk to you. They'll let this wagon in. They've agreed to that. But they're not going to let all of those students in free. They're going to have to pay. I think them was cost you 50 cents or a dollar. They're not going to get in free. And uh, I says, uh, just between you and me, I think that's a better deal than the bloody fight that's going to get out here. And because they're prepared, and, uh, and he could, from where he was, he could look, and there was quite a crowd of the boys in together. And this crowd, we had them outnumbered quite a bit, so they backed off and we let the wagon in. And that's the way it was settled. But, Who won the game? Uh, how old you did, I think, 22. Yeah, they won nearly all out of the game, but that didn't make any difference. <laughs> you had to play them, fight them. I remember a fellow that used to live here in Garber. He was on the team one time when we played OU at Guthrie. And they'd meet down at Guthrie to play games. And, uh, they'd kick the, kick the ball in the creek. Well, that was the first game they played, wasn't it? I believe it was. Yep. The early game. And this boy... Uh, Fellow by the name of Stebbins. And, uh, was Lewis was Lewis Field there at that time? Uh, the uh, I believe they called it Lewis Field. I don't know what it was. Uh, it was maybe no. It's about the same location. Just about the same location. Uh, while I was there, we built a new section of the stadium. And I helped to finance $75 worth of that. And uh, they built this new section. As a freshman, they, uh, uh, you all had to wear beanie caps. Well, we had one kid with a pretty nice family and everything else. And he went out to that freshman football game one day. He didn't have his beanie cap. And he sat up on top of the stand with a girlfriend. Well, uh, I wasn't in the group that went up to get him, but there was a group that went up to get him. <clears throat> and I caught him part way down, coming down that stand, just fighting and wrestling the whole way down. They ruined his suit. They took him down and ran him through a paddle line. And uh, 
Then the next day they took up a collection, went downtown, bought him a new suit. <laughs> Boy, they just had his suit tore off of him. Summer camp. Uh, quite an experience. Uh, went down there and uh, spent the time. At, or at that time, we'd been issued our uh, cadet officers' uniforms, and uh, uh, I had the privilege of uh, having a company of regular soldiers, and it happened to be the one, and I forget what company it is, they had the squads and they had the carts and the horses with it, and uh, we had a commanding officer, a general from Washington, come by for review. It was a huge mix right in with the regular army officers. This Fort Sill? Fort Sill. They had the, the all tents, one row of tents. One side would be regular officers, the other side would be the reserve. And uh, we drilled and got sick. Of course, you're bound to get sick in camp. And the only thing they'd give you was castor oil poured it out of a five-gallon can, 100 cc's. Ever, nobody would ever report the sick call again after that, because you didn't, you didn't have anything but just warm water to drink to wash it down or anything. You don't think there wasn't a bunch of sick country kids? How did you travel from still water to the ball? Uh, I traveled uh, with a Model T. A group of us traveled, and we had uh, uh, trouble, uh, we had a vacation, I believe it was a split in time or something. We was gone one weekend and we went back down and we got to Apache and uh, had car trouble. We had hitchhike on in, left a car at Apache, went back to get a car that didn't have any tires on. That fella, he never did see anybody around it. I just suppose it, that's the way you drove it in. And did you get your commission? Yes. I, uh, I never did go to summer camp or anything after that. Didn't renew it. And so when World War II was coming out, well, I was too old. They didn't want those vines. How long did you serve on active duty after? I, I didn't really. I, after I finished at OSU, I didn't go to uh, oh, didn't. any camps at all. Didn't have to. Okay. And uh, I was a major at OSU. At, one of the battalions. Who was head of the Army ROTC in those years? Major Pate. Major Pate? Yeah. The ATE. Is the old armory still over there? That's, was that there at that time? No, no, the old armory was, uh, you know where the engineering building, well, let's go back to Student Union. Yes. Right across from it is, I believe, uh, English now, it's the old Gunderson Hall. Uh, the armory was right north of Gundy. And uh, they had the armory was upstairs, and they had uh, stuff around them. The cafeteria was downstairs, and that's all torn down. A new building put in there. When uh, I took English under a Professor Doty down there, and uh, we was in the third floor of Gunderson Hall, and was sitting on uh, two by twelves on nail cakes for seats in an English class. So you can see it was having a little rough time. Getting what was it like to be a college student in the 1920s? You know, yeah, I've heard about the Roaring Twenties at Charleston. Uh, the, you, was, you was expected to, to be in. You had rules that you were supposed to follow, be in at a certain time. Uh, the, the girls, I believe it was 10 o'clock, except on weekends, and then they'd be out until 11. Well, they crawled out of the windows. They, they did other things and stay in the rooms. But as a whole, uh, they were in, and so was the man. And the campus was pretty quiet at midnight. Did he speak easy from Stillwater? Uh, there, I don't know of any. I do know that there was undoubtedly some, but not very much. This Eddie Moran, uh, he was—he carried a gun the whole time. He carried a pistol, 
on him all the time he went to school. And uh, whenever he got short of money, he went down to tell me one day, he went down to where there's a crap game. He knew there's a crap game in the southern part of the town. He went down and he pulled out his gun and fucked it down. He says, I looked around and there wasn't anybody there. He says, there's that money. He says, somebody's going to get it. So I just stuck in my pocket. But he got by with things that nobody else could get around anyway. Many bootleggers and moonshine in the water. Don't know that, but do know uh, up here and up in Grant County. Yeah, there was bootleggers. There were bootleggers here in the oil fields. A fellow by the name of Duffick was the big bootlegger that I knew. Duffick. Yeah, he knew Duffick. When did they open this oil field, Norfolk Well, I, I think it was in the, eight, uh, in, the eight, in the teens, late teens. I couldn't, when they first opened it. There is uh, now, I think, uh, you'll be able to contact some people to give you actual dates on that. But uh, I was only acquainted with it in driving by to going to school. And if I come down to Enid and went by, I went by the oil field. Go down here and go down through Lucene and go into Stillwater. There's quite an oil field there. I'd like to get more information on the 101 branch and the 101 Long West Show. Uh, when did you first meet the Miller Brothers? Well, I uh, was through my grandfather, was the Miller Brothers, was uh, uh, in there at uh, Marlin, Oklahoma, and later would become Marlin, White Eagle. And that's where they kept their train. And the ranch was right there just below White Eagle. And uh, uh, the only contact I had with him was when he was back up at the, uh, uh, the shows that they have there in town. My grandfather, of course, knew each one of them individually. And then when I met Little Joe, as we called him, at Stillwater, well, he said he thought he could uh, arrange to get some of the entertainment down. And he did, these Arabian tumblers. We took them over to feed them at Big Ben's cafeteria. And uh, uh, being Arabians, uh, you know, there was dark skin. And Big Ben came down and he says, no, you don't feed those niggers in here. He says, no niggers eats here. Big Ben is the one that run the cafeteria. And we argued that they were not Negroes. And he says, you you can argue all you want to. They're not going to eat here. You bring them around the back. I'll beat them out the back. Well, we was thankful that they didn't understand English because the fellow was with it, and we agreed we was going to have to beat them somewhere else because we knew them, and because uh, he'd take a knife and he was big, and he, he'd knife you before he'd let you bring in them. So we took him out to another place to swims and fed him down there. They never did know the difference, and we told them that they just run out of food. And, but uh, that there was a, a race prejudice there that on campus. Now there was a few. Uh, even when my son was down in school, now we accepted Chinese. I roomed with a Chinese student that helped me through college. Then you'd have the, some Japanese. You'd have some. Uh, Various nationalities come there to school, but very few Negroes, if any. There's people there that are blacker than Negroes, but they were not Negroes, as we know. And uh, the Big Bang and the, and the campus just wouldn't allow it. Zach Miller, did you know him? Who? Zach Miller. I uh, didn't know him personally, just knew him through uh, Grandpa. And then down to the, as it, well, I, I met uh, some of the Millers. They had us up there, the judging teams, they'd have us up to 101 ranch and, and judge livestock on their ranch, and they'd feed us steaks that the college kids never got anywhere else. And it was a marvelous experience. They killed their own animals and all at the slaughterhouse there. And it was a, quite a, a treat to get to go to 101 ranch. Tell me about the Wild West shows. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, it was quite a deal. I, the thing that I can remember more than anything was those bucking horses 
And of course, I didn't understand what made a buck in those days, and that is the, the girt around the flanks. But uh, they had one of these wild horses out there that, that nobody could handle in the ring, and had Mutt and Jeff, those clowns. And uh, Mutt would beat Jeff, chasing Jeff, and Jeff was just from this wild horse, and every, Jeff would run underneath his belly and everything. Mutt would run up to him and fall back. But they had some good ropers. They had, uh, of course, in those is uh, the day when they had ropers. And they had those uh, uh, people who could really rope horses, and they could rope two or three at a time. Pictures, uh, I think, can show that they roped as high as five and six people riding abreast at one time. Some of those good ropers. Did you get in these shows free? Yeah, I got into the shows free then because I was just a kid. And you were I, Uncle Sam's? Uncle Sam's kid. There was a trick writer named Jackie Lair. I couldn't. Uh, she still lives in Tonka City. She's yeah. up in her 90s now. I see. But they were they were hospitable folks, and they were fine. They just got caught. Uh, uh, I've been told that if the 101 Ranch, even with all their mistakes and everything, if they could have held that ranch for uh, three more years, they could have possibly salvage the ranch. And they know they could have in five years. The land values went back up until that ranch would have paid off again. And they got in. But they just caught them at a low. And when you put the, the B on a fellow when he's low, and that's the same thing that I've told a lot of the bankers that I'm associated with here. If you've done business with this family for a period of two or three or four generations, and you know the family, you better go in there and try to work out something with them on what they can pay. And uh, because you'll appreciate having that family as your customers years to come. And, but that's what 101 got caught in, and you couldn't do it. There's nothing they can do. You mentioned Joss Lee. Yeah. Uh, the uh, a community I lived up at Manchester always worked, was working for the betterment of their kids. And the schools that have little uh, Amiga literary societies around every community would have one. And they'd debate questions. A lot of the people never gone to school, but they could go and they'd have a schoolhouse full of people because there'd be two sides. And uh, those people always liked to take one side or the other. And they had no radio, no television, very few telephones. So when you had a meeting at a schoolhouse, it was full. And they'd take the two sides and that's the way they educated a lot of the people. And uh, Josh Lee was on a, a Lyceum number. And they uh, had uh, at Manchester this license circuit come up and we met above Simmons store. They had a big auditorium up there that later become uh, uh, a picture. I have a picture show up there and all. And Josh had come through and the reason I remember him so well uh, was that uh, he told good jokes. And he was an entertainer. And he was a good entertainer at I don't remember anything. I do know later years that he become quite prominent in Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. I believe I believe he was out of OU when he was up there. I was was he U.S. senator? What was he U.S. senator? He was he was elected to some some place. It was that same town up there that uh, uh, had the old magic lantern. And while a fella cranked and generated enough electricity to in the arc to get the light to show the. Uh, pictures on the screen, then the next flip would be the wording or wording under that picture. I had a piano player and you'd go in they'd crank that thing and that was a movie. Then uh, the, uh, later on uh, we come to the radio, regular movie, then we come to the radio. Uh, Waukita, the group there had built a new community building when the radios had first come out. And they decided if it was going to educate the kids, 
is going to have to have a radio that's capable of bringing in this music. So they contracted with a fellow to build a radio, and uh, they bought it and put it in the community building. Well, again, we're sitting on two the twelves on nail cans, and uh, went down with grandmother to hear that radio, Grandmother Long, that we mentioned a while ago, and drove down in a horse and buggy, and uh, the, the, the radio was possibly uh, six, eight feet high, the face of it, and it was about all oh, 12 to 20 foot long. And they had a platform, the fellow walked back and the dial, they turned one dial and turned the other, similar to the old Atwater Kent tuning. And he'd get all of those tuned and finally got music to come in that night. And everybody was, uh, oh, they was there possibly for a half hour, squeak, squawk, squeak, squawk, before they finally got music. And they got the music and on the way home, grandmother says, Will, that was a sin. I says, well, Mom, what do you mean? says, that was a sin. They told you that that come in over the air. And says, it didn't. Says, I had to go to the outhouse. And as I went out, I looked. And there's wires running out of that door, run right up on top of that roof. Well, uh, she didn't, never did. She died believing that was a fake deal. That, uh, that she would accept the voice going through a piece of wire that she and Becky Foster used down here talking across the Simmer River. But going through the air, that, that was impossible. She died. And then I got to think in later years, uh, what, what have we done in radio when you're riding along in your car listening to what? Here the other day I was riding with Ed, and his telephone rang, and he picked it up, and kept it driving, and kept it talking. And I saw as the same thing happened on the trip to Moline. A fella took his car and put it in, dialed a number and took the radio and talked back home.